Good morning, everyone. I'm so thankful that you're here with us today. I want to welcome you here to River Hills Church. Whether you're here in the house or you're on watching online, we're so glad to have you with us this morning. Um, let's just stand. We're going to ask the Lord to uh, be with us this morning, and then we're going to enter in a uh, time of uh, song and worship, and then we're going to go into worship in the Word, okay? We're going to listen to the Word. Uh, Father, we just so thankful for this day, Lord. I just pray that you would be with us. I pray that uh, the songs that we sing would be a sweet-smelling savor to your ear, Lord. And Father, I just pray that you bless the people today. I pray their hearts would be ready to receive whatever you have for them today. And I pray that they would just fall on good Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. My Redeemer lives. Hallelujah.
just worship you, Lord. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. There is freedom here. Hallelujah. There is freedom in Him. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.
God, that you're here among us right now, touching us. Bless your holy name. Worthy is the Lamb of God. Thank you, Lord, for being among us, giving us awareness that you are here right now. And you just don't show up to make us feel good. You show up to do your sovereign work. And those today that need encouragement, God, I believe they're on a collision course to receive it from you right now. And those that need healing, are stepping into the flow of your spirit and receiving it right now. And those today, God, that just need to know that you care about them, that you have your arms wrapped around them, you have your hand extended to take hold of theirs, to let them walk in the liberty, the freedom, the presence of their almighty God. Worthy is the Lamb. Holy is His name. Righteous are His ways. Thank you, God, that you've been touched by the feelings of our infirmity. Thank you, God, you've been where we are. And you're our source of deliverance. O oh, Lamb of God, we praise your name. Worthy. Worthy is the Lamb. To sing to Him, worship Him, praise Him, magnify Him, glorify Him. Oh Jesus, we praise God, exalt Your name. We ask in the name of Jesus that God we sense the healer we know that's here right now. Reach into our home. Touch her. Encourage your husband today. Show him your wonderful love and mercy. Oh God, we, we pray. We continue to pray for our brother Gerard today that you bring life and wholeness healing to his body by your stripes he is and was healed oh God Lord God continue to touch Sharon today and strengthen her body as she's recovering God from surgery and a long illness Lord in your name it's the only name we got you're the only source that we have so we turn to you in our time of trouble, in our time of need. And we trust you. We pray for our country, God. So divided. God, and everything that is wrong seems right, and everything that's right seems wrong. And God, we know that you can sort it all out. And we know that you can bring to us what we need to know and what we need to hear and what we need to understand this day. God, we ask that you would strengthen and bring life once again to our nation, to our community, to our states. Oh God, we call upon you and ask for healing. And we thank you that you hear us. And we're grateful, God, that you answer us. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. He's a good God, isn't he?
He's a wonderful God. Praise his name. You may be seated this morning and thank you for worshiping him. It's, it's just encouraging to see God's people praise the Lord and exalt his wonderful name. And uh, I, I trust that those who are viewing online are worshiping the Lord just like we are. And one thing that I have determined is that we're still going to be us. We're still going to be us. In fact, people are watching us in New York State right now, and uh, people watching us in Missouri right now, and people watching us in various other parts, but we're still going to be us. Amen. And we're just going to let them have a sneak peek into what God's doing here in Nebraska. Amen. Well, today begins National BGMC month. It's called March Madness. You thought it had to do with a ball and a hoop, didn't you? But today begins BGMC March Madness. So in a moment, I will show you a video, and I trust that you stopped by the table and picked up one of these little boxes that you could fill this month. Just put it together and, and save coins for lost souls this coming month to reach the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Christ. If you don't mind, watch the video. If you're at home, uh, you, you may only get the audio piece, but let's launch March Madness, shall we? Good morning, everyone. You should have received one of these in your bulletin this morning. I want you to take it out right now. Put it together and make your very own BGMC box. You see, March is Lost Change for Lost Souls Month. You might say, what is Lost Change? Well, I'm glad you asked. You see, Lost Change can be almost any place. Any coin that you find on the ground, well, it's lost and it belongs to BGMC. What about your couch? It's very possible that there is underneath the cushions or way down in the bottom of your couch. And wouldn't it be a shame if Jesus came back and there was enough change lost around your house that another person could have heard about Jesus? And what about your car? Do you have change in the ashtray of your car or maybe lying around underneath the seats? Well, it's lost and it belongs to BGMC. How about that unneeded pop or that piece of candy that you were getting ready to buy? You know what? Save those quarters. Give them to BGMC. We need your help. We need to fill these boxes. If you have change and it's in your little coin purse, ladies, well then it's safe. But if it's down in the deep, dark, dank recesses of your purse, then it's lost and it belongs to BGMC. Don't let this happen to you. Help us to win lost souls by collecting your lost change this month. Now, aren't you glad the kids are in BGMC this morning because they'd probably be running up and down the aisles robbing you or taking your money from you. And uh, I, I pick up coins wherever I go. Uh, if I find them in the parking lot, I pick them up. I, I even pick them up off the floor in department stores. I figure if they're going to leave it lay there, I'm going to pick it up and I put it in BGMC. In fact, I have a granddaughter who collects BGMC and she asked me, Papa, are you collecting coins for me? And so I collect coins for her. I think it's a conspiracy. She told me the other day, she goes, I spend all the pennies and I keep all the silver in my BGMC box. And so I think she's on the, on the right track. So I encourage you to pick up a BGMC box and uh, be a part of March Madness. Amen. Well, today we begin a new series, and I would invite you to turn in your Bibles to the book of Proverbs, Proverbs chapter 3. We're beginning a new series. Those of you who are here got to see the sluice box when you came in, and I know everyone's, what in the world is a sluice box? Well, I'm going to explain it to you in a few moments, but today in the message, you're going to need two articles. You're going to need an article that looks like this that you received in your bulletin, and you're going to need an article that looks like this that you received in your bulletin. And if you didn't receive it, uh, if you raise your hand, the ushers will be glad to assist you and make sure you have those two items because you'll need them in the sermon today. If you're online viewing and would like to have a copy, just email us and we'd be more than happy to send these to you 
this coming week. We're beginning to look at this new series so that we can get prepared for Easter. Easter's coming. It's about four weeks away. Can you believe that? Are you ready for Easter? I tell you, next week's the time change. We spring forward next week. Spring's on the 20th, I believe. I mean, a lot of neat things are happening in our lives right now. Proverbs chapter 3, we're going to be looking at that. But before we get there, there were two miners that spent half their lives looking for gold in the Pacific Northwest. Despite the mocking of the criticism of the townspeople, the two miners pressed on, believing that they had the ability to strike it rich. They were going to hit the payload. The pair soon became the joke of the town. Week after week, they returned from their labors empty-handed. Nevertheless, they pressed on with deep conviction and confidence that someday they would find what they were looking for. One sultry afternoon, however, after months of painstaking work in the old mine that produced nothing, they finally hit the pay dirt. One moment they saw the rock. The next, there was the glistening vein of, diamond, or, of gold that was shining in the mind. Oh, with the fury and the, the abandonment of, of where they were at, they began to dig fast and furious to, to get to the payload. And as they're beginning to do so, they didn't realize that they were moving some of the timbers and some of the supports to the mine in which they spent so much time meticulously digging. At one particular moment, one began to shout, We hit it rich. We finally made it. We'll no longer be the joke and the laugh of the town. All of a sudden, there began to be a sound, a sound that was not a good sound. Piers begin to crack. Timbers begin to loosen themselves, and dirt begins to fall. And suddenly, the mine shaft caves in. As they laid there, coughing and grasping for breath, as the mine filled up with dust they said we got to get out of here we need to get out of here and one of the miners laid there grasping the biggest nugget that he could ever lay his eyes upon and said no you leave you go i am staying with the mine as he laid there injured on the ground hold tightly holding he says come on we got to get out of here we got to leave here the injured miner clutched to the nugget held it to his chest and says i am not leaving here i have searched my entire life looking for the payload and i have finally found it leave me here you leave he said oh don't don't be foolish we got to get out of here all of a sudden another rafter shifted and the timbers begin to fall spilling more dirt he says, if I leave you here, he will surely die. What will I tell your family? What will I tell the people of the town? The injured miner clutching to the nugget as he wheezed his final breath, tell them I died rich. Tell them I died rich. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 13 and 14, happy is the man who finds wisdom and the man who gains understanding for her, for her proceeds are better than the profits of silver and her gain than fine gold. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity today to preach, share this word. I ask, Father, that you would speak to our hearts as we make this journey, as we look for the payload, as we look for the richness of the vein, but may we not find fool's gold, but may we find real gold that's found and given only by our almighty God. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' amazing name. May our hearts hear, our minds receive, and our spirits be transformed in your likeness. In Jesus we give thanks. Amen. Amen. One of the values of River Hills Church is that every person has a right to a presentation of the gospel at his or her level of understanding. We believe that, and we'll be sharing these four values that we have over the course of the next four weeks. But everyone in this room, everyone that's in the children's area, everyone that might be in the nursery, or everyone that might be listening online, has a right to the presentation of the gospel at his or her level of understanding. See, we are all on a journey. Would you agree? It's not a sprint. It's not a marathon. We're on a journey. 
We are all on different levels of spiritual growth. We are all different at different spiritual levels. If you look at the handout I give you, you'll see that all of us fall in one of the four categories of the spiritual journey. We're either an explorer, we're either a grower, we're either close to Christ, or we are Christ-centered. And we're going to look at those today as, as the outline, and then next week we're going to get into each one and unpack each one over the next three weeks. You'll see that like the gold sluice that you saw coming into the, the foyer, the gold sluice, at the very top of the gold sluice is where all the dirt and all the settlement, all the sand and all of the debris is dumped in. That's where we all begin. We all begin at the top of the sluice. And as the water filtrates down through the sluice and it begins to move the debris and it begins to move the heavy objects along and it begins to move other pieces of sediment away, the gold then begins to find itself embedded behind one of the, the braces that, that go down the, one of the slots. The, and the gold will get caught there and it will get hung up there for the miner to later pick up as all of the debris floats away. All of us are at one of these four levels in our spiritual growth. We are always filtering things out of our life. There are things that need to be filtered out of our life as we do this Christian journey, as we walk and become what God wants us to become. So I trust in this series that I, I help you learn how to live out your spiritual life and find someone that will encourage you coach you, mentor you to grow to the next level. You say, yeah, but I don't, I don't need to. I want you to know I have three or four mentors that speak into my life on a regular basis. In, in fact, I have a dear friend of mine uh, who's now retired, and, and I just talked to him the other day, and he says, oh, it was just a joy to talk to you. And he began to encourage me, began to speak to me, began to challenge me. He's asked me hard questions. So even I, as your pastor, I have three or four people that I let them speak and say anything into my life that needs to be spoken and needs to be declared to help me reach my potential in the kingdom of God. Now, I want to help you today to identify the stage that you're at. Many times I've used this little track when I've been witnessing to people. I think this is the best track for witnessing. It is encouraging. It's not degrading. You know, some people use things that, that you know, like the shell shock people. But I hand this to people and I say, tell me where you're at in this journey. Show me where you're at in this journey. And a lot of people, oh, they'll go, I'm right here. And I'll go, explain it to me. Why do you think you're right there? And I say, oh, because, and they'll, then they'll begin to describe where they're at and how they, how they got there and why they're still there. Every one of us at one of these four levels, every one of us at one of these four stages of our spiritual development. You begin to see that, that as you identify where you are, then you can begin to move forward to become what God wants you to become. See, we, we need to understand that that when you take gold after it's been processed out of the sluice, you'll find that gold then is put in a crucible. And when it's put in a crucible, great heat's applied to it. The Bible even talks about uh, gold being applied to great fire. And then you'll find that when it's put to the, to the fire, the, the, the impurities that are in the gold will then begin to rise to the top. As the impurities begin to rise to the top, then the, the guy who is making jewelry or he's refining the gold, he'll begin to scrape the drags or the impurity or the dross off the top of the gold. And he'll go through this process many, many times in order to get the gold to its purest form. The Bible says that we are gold that's put in fire and we are to be refined. Now, that's the challenging piece that some people don't like the refining process. Because when the heat's turned up, sometimes we climb out of the pot. Sometimes we climb out of the crucible. Why? Because we feel that maybe God's being unfair. We think that maybe God's doing something to us that we don't like. But really, God is trying to get the impurities out of our life so that we can move to the next level of spiritual growth, that we can become all that God wants us to become. Periodically, he removes the crucible and skims the stuff, the impurities, the dross off of the gold so that the gold can continue to become as pure as possible. The process takes several times, several days, several, depends what degree of purity of gold you want. 
And that's how our lives are. God is constantly allowing us to be put through the fire, put through the heat, not to punish us, not to destroy us, not to defeat us, but to believe in us that we can become what God has called us to be, that we can accomplish the will of God. It's not a dream. It's not something that we think will happen in the sweet by and by. God wants us to become what he's called us to become. We are his children. We are called by his name. And he is giving us the ability to become all that God wants us to become. The sluice, boss is, the sluice box is a device that helps us discover the goal much quicker. In fact, when the impurities are put in and it begins to, the water begins to flow through it, it begins to separate things real quick. It traps things that need to be trapped and it moves things on that needs to be moved on. God wants to move the stuff that doesn't need and shouldn't belong in our life along so that he can keep the stuff that needs to stay in our life my love, my steadfastness, my persecution and suffering that happened to me in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra, which persecution I endured. Yet from them all the Lord rescued me. Indeed, all who desire to live godly lives in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, while evil people and imposters will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. Now, I want to pause. Why did I say that? Because some of us today feel we're being persecuted. Some of us today, and you will experience persecution. I believe if you live long enough, you will see persecution come to the church in America. But I want you to understand this. The Lord is with you. The Lord is with you. And God has never seen the righteous forsaken. And God will never see the righteous beg for bread. He will take care of his children. He will be with his children. But we must understand those who desire to live a godly life will be persecuted. You desire to live for the Lord, look out. It will come. You'll be put through the sluice box. You will be refined and you'll be reshaped. But when it comes to the final end, yes, the imposters, the imposters are going to keep deceiving. Yes, the imposters are keep seeing bad things. I heard this week so unfortunate that Congress does not care about knowing the will of God. Oh, that alarmed me. I thought, oh my, how sad can that be? How sad when our country no longer depends on the Almighty God? How sad when the people in our nation no longer depend on the, the will of God? And how sad that even yet some who sit in the church would rather do their will than God's will. See, we're all in this together. But God wants us to come forth as godly, holy, righteous people. The Bible tells us in John chapter 3, verses 1 through 3, there was a man by the name of a Pharisee by the name Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher, came from God, for no one can do these things that you do unless God is with him. And Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say unto you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus replied, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you're born of the water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel at what I say to you. You must be born Again, Mark wrote this in chapter 4, verse 4. And he who sowed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured it. Nicodemus was an explorer. If you look at the list, most explorers don't know Jesus. They're looking for something, they're longing for something, they're trying to find something. In fact, you'll notice in the notes that are in the box, it says, I believe in God, but I'm not sure about Jesus. My faith is not a priority to me, but I'm exploring Christianity. See, God is not the issue. Jesus is the issue. Jesus Christ is the issue. If you get it wrong about Jesus, you get it wrong about God. Because Jesus came to reveal who God is like. Jesus came to reveal his Father to us. And when you get Jesus right, you understand God. 
You understand that he's the almighty sovereign, the master of the universe. He's the great I am. He was there before the beginning of time and he will be there after time ends because our God is the almighty. See, Nicodemus was trying to figure out who this God was. See, he was exploring his attitude, his motive. He had this drive. He was curious. He wanted to know truth. Remember Pilate, he says, what is truth? Everyone's searching for truth. He's trying to first find the significance, the inner peace, the joy that comes. Nicodemus was attracted to Jesus because of the miracles he did. But also he was attracted because Jesus and him had something in common. They were both teachers. And in fact, if you will study the life of Nicodemus, you'll find that he wanted to know more about the doctrine that Jesus taught. Nicodemus himself was a teacher of the Jews. Now, let me pause and say this. Not all Pharisees were hypocrites. See, we have a tendency, if we're not careful, that we just lump everybody in the same box, put everybody in the same boat. We, we do that today. Nicodemus was one who was searching for truth. Nicodemus was one who had a deep, sincere quest for truth. That's why, you see, he came to Jesus at night. Some say, well, he came to Jesus at night because he was afraid. No, I believe Jesus, Jesus met with Nicodemus at night because he knew that everyone else would be sleeping and everyone else would be at home and he would have some one-on-one -on -one face time with Jesus. He knew that he would have the master's undivided attention. He knew that he could ask him the tough questions, the strong questions, and, and find out what this man was all about that came from God. See, there are essential two types of explorers today. The first consists of those who attend church, who, 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 who are exposed to the message in the presence of God. But they are, they are either numb or they have no interest in responding to God's call in their life. There are some people here today that fit that description. Sad. How sad. See, their motive is to tend to traditional church to find comfort and obligation that maybe to their spouse or maybe to their parents. They say that 61% of all explorers are between the ages of 30 and 49 years old. And 54% of them attend church three or more years. And 12% of them have attended church more than 10 years. This suggests that worship for them is some type of virtual meaningless. They just do it out of ritual. They just do it because they feel obligated. They do it to be a part of the culture. They have become spiritual fossils, if I may use that term. This may mean that they are feeling increasingly more convicted or just being tired of trying to be urged to be connected to the almighty God. The other type of explorer is the person whom God has impregnated him or her. They have a true desire and curiosity. They come because they've heard this message. They want to know who this man, like Nicodemus, this man Jesus is. And now comes the expert to the master and says to him, tell me about this being born again. John chapter 6 verse 44 says, no one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him do you know the same thing applies today we we have unfortunately we have so programmatic church that because church is so programmed we think we can come to god on our own whim and our own wishes we think we can come to god on our own agenda now i'm thankful that as a believer i can enter his courts with thanksgiving come to him with praise i can honor him any time of my day any time of my life any time of the year there but you can only be saved by the spirit of god drawing you you can only come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ by him wooing you and bringing. I'm thankful that today is the, sal the day of salvation. I'm thankful that the Spirit is wooing and calling people to come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. But you can sit there and resist him. You can sit there and ignore him. You can sit there and say, no, no, I'll come to you, God, when I want to. No, it doesn't work on our terms. It works on his terms. And I'm thankful that today is the day of salvation. But that's why we need to respond to him when he's, like Nicodemus, he responded as the Spirit wooed him and was drawing him. Jeremiah 30, 1, 3 says, the Lord appeared to him from afar. So here's what we need to do. We need to consider ourselves special to God. We need to understand you're valuable to God. You need to understand that God cares about you. You need to understand that God is drawing you, wooing you, 
calling you. Oh, today is the day to be saved. Today is the day to know Jesus. Today is the day to repent of your sins. Today is the day to find him. Move from being an explorer to knowing him as your Savior. Oh, today, there are some at the level of interest and other facts very, may, may, may determine whether or not they want to know Jesus. Some, some think that it costs too much. Some think, well, you know, I have to give up this. Oh, do you really have to give up anything? Do I, does this temporary life mean more to me than the eternal life? Does this here in this moment and in this hour, this instant, more precious to me than knowing God for eternity? Some think so. See, there's a wide spectrum of where people are in the forming of their faith. And this, this is like the embryo and the physical development of a mother's womb. As the baby develops, and, and every embryo develops at a different stage or a different level. I remember our youngest daughter, Rebecca, they, 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 they encouraged us to abort her. And I went, what are you talking about? Well, you know, she, we don't think that she's going to be normal. Well, she's a roach. I haven't met a normal one yet. Yeah. You know? Oh, no, 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 no. We, we, we think that she's going to have some serious... And my wife and I had this meeting. We, if she ends up being uh, developmentally delayed or she ends up being a, a down child, syndrome child, she's our child and we're going to take care of her and we're going to love her because God gave her to us. And I remember when they went to do this really special hype type uh, sonogram and, and the nurse went, wow. And I go, is that a good wow? And she goes, She's perfect. See, we need to understand that babies all develop differently. And as they develop, we need to understand they're a gift from God. And we need to understand that even though some may be a little slower, or a little behind, God still values them and they're still important to them. And we must understand that we develop differently as Christians. We're not all on the same level. We're not all on the same page. Some of us aren't even in the same chapter or the same book. But we're going to develop and become what God wants us to be because we know that the eternal life in Jesus Christ is far more valuable than the temporary life we have now. Some are confused and anxious. Knowing there is something more, but not knowing how to get there. There are people today that live in your neighborhood. There are people today that you work with. They're searching and they're looking and they're trying to find. They're living in ignorance. And we need to help them know the God that we know. Some are frustrated and being pulled in different directions, diff driven to find the unknown. They're seeking, they're looking, they're, perse they're persecuted by those who don't understand. They're questioning, they're, they're indecisive. See, you notice on the chart, you notice there are those who are exploring. There are those who are growing. There are those who are close to Christ. There are those who are Christ-centered. Let me ask you this, and you can just ponder, where are you headed? Where are you going? How are you going to get there? I've noticed in this journey, though, people begin to stall. I've, I've noticed, uh, like in the sluice, the sediments begin to stall in their journey through the sluice back into the stream. You, you may watch something, and, and, and I really wanted to get really fancy. I wanted to run water through it so you get the whole concept of seeing how things would get caught and how things would get hung up, and I just didn't have time to develop that and, and put that. So may, maybe if we ever do this again, maybe we'll do it. But people get stalled. They get caught behind one of the, the stops. We get caught. We get stalled. Some of us stall out exploring Christ. Some of us stall out and growing with Christ. Some of us stall and getting close to Christ. And believe it or not, there are people who get stalled that are Christ-centered. They they're, like the, they're like Nicodemus. They get, they get hung up. See, Nicodemus got hung up on the physical birth when Jesus was trying to explain a spiritual birth. If we're not careful, we get stalled out. We get hung up on the things that we shouldn't get hung up on. We get, we get stalled on things that, that really don't matter, things that we make to be important that aren't really important. See, what causes us to stall? I've often asked myself, what causes me to stall in this, pro in this process? What are, what are the triggers? What are the distractions? What are, what are the enemies of my soul that want to stall me, that keep, that keep me where I'm at so I can justify staying where I'm at? Stalled. 
How do I get out of stall? Well, Jesus began to show Nicodemus how he could get out of his stall. He began to point him to a eternal salvation rather than a, a temporary deliverance. I, I think if we're not careful in the day in which we live, we're, we're like the nation of Israel. We want to be delivered from this party or that party. We want to be delivered from that part of our country or that part of our... Oh, friends, don't get hung up in that bondage. Get hung up that knowing who you are in Christ Jesus, knowing that you can make a difference as a believer, knowing that you can impact the world and the streets and the communities that you live in. But if we're not careful, we'll let our nation's capital stall us from living for Jesus. We'll let our state stall us from living for Jesus. Now, I'm not saying out and be blatant rebellious and things of that nature, because I know people are watching this on Facebook. I'm not saying go out and create a mark. I'm saying live for Jesus. I'm saying do what God has called you to do and quit blaming everything else for your place of stalling and say, God, help me move from where I'm stalled so that I can go to the next level of growth and maturity in Christ Jesus. See, Jesus said it to Nicodemus in chapter 3, verse 5 through 7. Truly, I say to you, unless one is born of the water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. But do not marvel that I've said to you must be born again. To instruct Nicodemus is the basis of salvation. Our Lord uses four different illustrations, but I just want to look at one. Notice verse 7, he talks about birth. All human beings have experienced natural birth. That's real rocket science, isn't it? You all got here via your parents. You all got here by natural birth. One of my questions is, how many of you want to get to heaven when your life here is over? Oh, nobody wants to go to heaven, huh? Okay, there's three hands, okay. If you expect to go to heaven, you must experience the supernatural birth from above. If you want to go to heaven, you've got to know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. There's no other way to, to the Father except through Jesus. Jesus was speaking to Nicodemus about spiritual birth, but Nicodemus could only get hung up on physical birth. To be born of water is to be born physically, but to be born of the Spirit is to be born spiritual. See, just as there are two parents in the physical birth, there's two parents for spiritual birth. There's the Spirit of God. The Bible says it's the Spirit of God that woos us and draws us to Christ. The Spirit of God convicts us of our sins and we repent of our sins. And then there's the Word of God. And the Word of God then leads us and guides us into righteousness and truth. And we follow the Word of God and we obey the things of the Word of God. And we just don't obey them because we have to. We follow them because we want God to impart his presence into our lives. So the Spirit of God takes the Word of God, and then the Word of God then enters the life into the sinner, into the explorer, and he becomes a child of God. So what are the catalysts that propel you forward? You'll notice what is propelling me forward. Notice there, if you, if you look on the bottom of the page, if you look at the second part of the page where the cross is and the two guys are standing, what's, what's propelling me? See, I can't earn heaven. Jesus Christ is God, serving the church, asking God for guidance, and reflecting on the Bible. Those are the beginning part. Those are the catalysts. Those are the things that I begin to see. Ah, all of a sudden, then all of a sudden, the revelation begins to come. I just want to know, I want to know him, not just know about him. I want to experience him, not just hear about him. I know that I can't earn my way to heaven. It's by grace through faith in Jesus Christ, not of myself. So I begin to explore that and I begin to see that. And then I begin to grow and move to the next level. That's where I let the word of God and the spirit of God bring regeneration. And he begins to transform my life into the likeness that Jesus Christ desires for me. So how do I help someone in this stage to take the step? I then begin to share them my story. I begin to share them his story. And when you begin to share them his story of what Christ has done in your life, then they become attracted to your, just like Jesus. He begins to talk to Nicodemus. He doesn't use, he doesn't talk old English. He doesn't use some, some impressive 
terminology. He just says, hey, let me tell you my story. Let me tell you about my father. Let me tell you what my father in heaven is all about. Let me tell you why he sent me here. Let me express to you the power of what he's doing in my life that wants to work in your life. Begin to tell people your story. Then the second thing happens, they become curious and they want to grow. Notice there in your chart, 2 Timothy chapter 3 verses 14 through 17. But as for you, continue in what you've learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you've learned it and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable for teaching, reproof, for correction and training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. So what do, you, what do you want your life to look like six months from today? I want to be six months closer to God then than I am now. But it just doesn't happen by saying, I want to be that way. It happens when I put the plan together that the Spirit of God did it, salvation, that the presence of God did when he saved me. He began, I'm no longer exploring my options. I am now going to grow in the options. Notice here, it says, I have chosen to cross the line and trust Jesus for salvation. God is for me and I feel his help. I just need to keep growing. Notice, I moved in the bottom. Notice this, I know God personally. I have a personal experience with the Almighty God. How many know Jesus as your personal Savior? Amen. Hallelujah. Aren't you thankful that you have a personal relationship with God? Praise his name. I'm through. I'm ecstatic to know that Jesus Christ is my Savior. Notice, he says, I'm asking God for guidance. I don't know about you, and I know this may sound kind of self-exalting, or it doesn't mean, I tell you, I pray all the time. All the time. I'm sitting somewhere, I'm praying, I'm in my office, I'm praying, I'm driving down the street, I'm praying, I'm hunting, I'm praying, I'm walking. I was up this morning early praying. I was seeing God. I want to be one of those people who always want to talk to God no matter what I have to talk about. I don't always need to ask God for something. I don't always need to have a request. I just want to hang out with him. It's like my wife. I love my wife. I love hanging out with my wife. I like being with my wife. Why? Because I love her and I want to get to know her and I want to be a part of her life and we don't have to do anything. We don't have to say anything. You say, you sound like you're dating. Well, maybe that's what we're doing all over again. When you're empty nesters, you can do that. I've tell you a story. I was smoking her the other the other night in a game called Phase Ten. I was eating her lunch. I was destroying her. Did I tell you I was putting her under the table? Remember, there's ten phases to Phase Ten. I knew to be a good man and keep my mouth shut. Because guess who won? The person I was putting under the table. She came out of nowhere and just mopped me up, put me away, tucked me up and stuck me in the drawer. I'm telling you, you'll never find that at a long distance relationship. You have got to be personal. You have got to be up close. You got to be face to face with him. Friends, today, if you want God in your life, he can't be something you do on Sunday or Wednesday. He has to be someone that's involved in every facet, every part of your life, every situation, every circumstance, because that's how you get to know him. That's how you begin to see the power of him. That's how you get to understand him and everything else grows strangely to him because you know God and you see God. Hallelujah. See, the challenge is we need to find someone to help us in our journey. You know, my, my mom, uh, if she's watching, she'll probably scold me later, but, but my mom has always had a challenge with her weight. She's, she's been a part of different weight groups and different things, but one thing my mom taught me was she never lost weight alone. She was always having someone that held her accountable. She was always having someone that was weight watching. I remember saying, oh, I got to weigh in today. Oh, I'm thinking, mom been naughty. Well, you know, if you, gotta, if you talk at like, oh, I got to weigh in today, you did something wrong. You probably ate one too many Twinkies. I don't know. But I learned that my mom was more successful 
when she had help. You got to get this. You are not going to get to where you need to go by yourself. You need help. I need help. As I mentioned earlier, I have people who mentor me. I have people who speak into my life. You need to find someone that will go on the spiritual journey with you. There's no lone rangers. If they are, they become lone strangers. And they fall away. We have got, that's how you stall. If you try to do it on your own, you're going to stall out. Oh, now I can hear it. Well, you know, all I need is Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Well, how's that been working for the last 500 years? Some people, we got to, are, are still where they've always been. We need to understand that we need help. Why? Because persecution is going to, remember in the text, he says, you will experience persecution. Persecution is going to come your way. And if you don't have someone to fall back on, remember the Bible says that two, two are better than one? Because if one falls in the ditch, the other one gets them out. But I have seen so many single casualties. Well, I just give up on God. Why? Why are you giving up on God? Well, because they have no support base. They have no one to help them keep growing. We need people to help us keep growing. We need people to speak into our lives and encourage us to become what God wants us to be so that we keep moving in our journey. Because look out, persecution's going to come. The everyday daily grind's going to come. The everyday sifting's going to happen. The everyday things that just, you know... The things that life throws us are going to come our way, and that's why we need someone to go with us on the journey. If you want to live a godly life, you will encounter persecution. Now, Paul didn't ask others to suffer with him because he was suffering for others. Sometimes the more mature has to take the hit for the one that they're helping. Sometimes we have to stand in the way. And if you want to wear your Superman cape or your shirt with the big S on it, go for it. But sometimes we have to get between them and the attack so that they don't fall. See, the fact that he was persecuted from city to city was proof that he was living a godly life. He kept going and God kept giving. See, some people today have the idea that godliness means escaping persecution when it's just the opposite. You will encounter hardship. You will encounter, I know this is not popular preaching, but you will encounter the thorns that come with the roses. You will experience the pain and the difficulty of life. So don't expect it. Don't run from it. Run to God and take hold of 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. All scripture is breathed out of God, is profitable for correction, is profitable for reproof, is profitable for the training of righteousness. So when everything that's coming against me, I hold to the things that God has breathed and I'm going to declare the promise of God's word in my life, stand on the word of God's life when even the persecution is in my life. Oh, but pastor... Well, let's go back to your favorite Psalm 23. When you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll be with you. He says, when you walk through the fire, I'll be with you. Our God is always going to be with us. We need to understand that. But see, if, if you're not growing, you're probably groaning. And then you're stalling. Mark said it like this in chapter 5. I think today is probably going to be two parts because I already, the clock, you know, I wish the Lord would cause the sun to stand still like it's going to advance next week. But, you know, Mark chapter 5, verse 5 says, Other seed fell on rocky ground where it did not have much soil, and immediately it sprang up, and since it had no depth of soil, and when the sun rose, it was scorched, and since it had no root, it withered away. The only way to defeat the devil's lies is with the truth of God. Now, now you've got, you got to get this. Because all, if we're not careful, all we want to do is bash the lies that we hear in the political arena. When we need to be speaking the truth of God's word. And we need to be declaring the truth of what God is doing in our life. I'm not saying ignore it. I'm a well aware of what's being said. I'm well aware of what's going on. But that, I, I don't want to be Nicodemus and dwell on that. 
I want to understand the truth that Jesus is trying to explain to me while that is going on so that I can rise up and be the child of God in a dark world that needs to see the truth. What happens is evil men and deceivers are going to get worse and worse. It's going to get worse. That's real encouraging, isn't it? It's going to get uglier. It's going to get mean. But guess what? They're going to deceive more and more. In these last days, there's going to be more deception. There's going to be more uh, intimidation. And the only way the believer is going to be able to understand the difference between the truth and the lie is the leading of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. This Word has not changed. It has withheld the course of eternity. And in fact, Jesus himself said, heaven and earth are going to pass away. But he says, my word will remain forever. We need to understand that today. We need to leave a, live according to the word of God, understand the culture in which we live in, and pray and seek God, and be men and women who stand up for the truth of the word. And see, signs and wonders and miracles take place in our midst. Hallelujah. And as a result of that, we are going to accomplish God. But see, you do that, you do that growing. See, I'm gonna, I want to grow. I want to be my ultimate objective, and I think I'm there, but I have to be careful that as being Christ-centered, I don't stall out being Christ-centered. I don't want to stand up and go, man, I made it. Give me my pen. Give me my badge. No, I have learned there's more to learn. Anyone else understand that? There's more. I've been saved now 40 years. I understand. I know far more now than I did then. But if I make it to 80, I'll know far more then than I know at 40. See, we, we need to help each other. We need to mentor each other. We need to love. See, love, we need to love each other enough to the point to where we are beginning to go in the right direction rather than in the wrong direction. We've we got to move from feeling sorry for people to encouraging people to follow Jesus like we follow Jesus. If you have to be like Paul, follow me like I follow Christ. Now that's a mouthful, I know. Because if they're not following Christ, it's going to be hard to follow Christ if you follow me. I want people to follow the Jesus that I follow. I want people to know the Jesus that I know. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 18 through 14. Just as Janus and Jamboree opposed Moses, so these men also opposed the truth. Men corrupted in mind and disqualified, reg disqualified regarding the faith, but they will not get very far, for their folly will be the plain to all, as was of those two men. You, however, have followed my teaching, my conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness, my persecutions, my sufferings that happened to me in Antioch and Iconium and Lystra, which persecution I endured, yet from them all the Lord rescued me. Indeed, all who desire to live godly lives in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, while evil people and impostors will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue what you have learned and what you firmly believe, knowing from whom you have learned it. You need to follow people that are knowing Jesus. You need to follow people that make God the focal point of their life. You need to follow people that pursue God like the hounds of heaven pursue the lost. See, we're headed to growing. Now notice, when we're growing, no, notice the things that are going to propel them. At the bottom of growing, it says, I know God personally. I, I've moved from just knowing about him, now I know him. Notice, I'm asking God to guide me. It's not saying, well, Lord, you know, if you have mercy on me and you want to help out an old sinner down here, could you have a little help? No, I'm asking God knowing that he's going to give me guidance and direction. Notice, I'm going to reflect on the Bible. The Bible is going to mean more to me than it has. The word of God is going to mean more to me as my guide and my rule than it ever has. And then I notice it says, I'm going to have solitude with God. You're going to have, oh, now hang on to this. Men are going to really freak out over this one. You're going to have some alone time with God. 
You're going to get alone with God. You're going to meditate. You're going to have a quiet time. You're going to get alone with God. Jesus taught us this. Jesus got alone with his Father. Why? That's where he found strength. That's where he found the encouragement. That's where he found the wisdom of dealing with certain things when he dealt with them. See, he knew the importance of being alone with God. How many know, how many know our world is so noisy, our world is so fast-paced that it wants to crowd out quiet? Some people, if I would just stop here for 30 seconds, some of you would start getting fidgety. Some of you say, oh God, have him say something. Oh my, I'm just getting really... Why? Because we are used to being busy. You need to find a time where you just have solitude to where you can listen and hear God speak. Notice the Bible, is the fi- notice it says that I'm going to share with others how Jesus changed my life. We called him... A testimony. Remember we used to have the old testimony service? You know the ones that scared me half to death? Was the God bless you one. Remember someone would get up and do their testimony and then they'd go, Oh, God bless you. And they would call out one of us young people. And I'd go, and I don't know why they pick on me. And I'm thinking, how am I going to get even with them? And I'd get up and I'd stammer and trip over my testimony. And then I would always have to God bless someone else in the youth group because I wasn't going to be the only youth being God blessed but I remember this I tripped and stumbled and fumbled over my words I just kind of sat there and hummed and might even stood there and shed a few tears probably more out of fear and I remember dear old saint that said it came up to me after oh your testimony just blessed me I'm like going bless you scared the snot out of me (laughs) we got to have people in our life that we can share our faith with. We've got to have people that we can tell someone what Jesus did for us. Your, your story needs to be written across the billboards of where you live. Your story is too good to be kept in the confines of your heart. So what causes me to stall? How do I get stalled at growing? If, I, if I'm not careful... Oh, yeah, yeah, I should read my Bible today. You you know, I I meant well, but I didn't do well. Well, see, here's the thing we got to do. If we're not careful, we'll make it all legalistic. And God doesn't want us to be legalistic Christians. The Pharisees taught us that. The hypocrites taught us that. Jesus wants us to want to be with him because of what he's done for us. Remember on Wednesday night, in view of God's mercy, in view of what God has done in my life, I give myself as a living sacrifice, holy, pleasing, acceptable. In view of what God has done, I'm willing to give this to him. In view of what God is doing, I'm willing to let God transform me and change me. In view of what God has accomplished in my life. See, I've got to understand, if I'm not careful, I'll get stalled. Well, you know, I, I didn't go to church last week. I didn't go. See, the thing, The issue about church attendance is really not church attendance. It's about the heart. It's not about showing up here on Sunday. It's about what's happening in your heart Monday to Saturday. That's the issue. And the issue is, God, how can I help move people that are stalled thinking that being a Christian is going to church when going to church, we celebrate, we celebrate the resurrection. We glorify the presence of God. We exalt the King of Kings as the body of Christ and we glorify what he's done through us throughout the week. But if you're not careful, you just say, well, I've got to go to church Sunday. Well, I gotta, what are they going to think? Well, someone the other day, I ran into them, they said, oh, I, haven't been. I said, don't, don't go there. I don't want to know why you haven't been here. I just want you to know I miss you. Well, no, you you don't have to tell. You don't have to give me an excuse. I just want you to know I prayed for you. I want you to know I want to bless you. I want you to know I want to encourage you. I want you to know I want to help you become what Jesus wants you to become. And then those things just happen out of second nature. But see, what's happened, we make that the primary when the primary is to know Jesus. That's the primary. So I've got to understand what causes me to stop. See, your great enemy is not the devil. Although he's real. And although he is certainly your adversary. But my self-centeredness, my lust, will defeat me far more than the devil will. 
Did you hear me? The devil is not my worst enemy. The man I get up and look in the mirror every morning is my worst enemy. The man I face in the mirror is the man that determines whether he's going to follow the Lord, serve the Lord, obey the word, honor the word, honor God. He is my greatest enemy. And then the devil likes to help out my enemy. See, what he does most of the time is really simply stirs up the dross that's already in us. James 1.14 says this, but each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desires. Not the devil's. My own. James 4.1 says, what causes quarrels and what causes fighting among you? Is it not that your passions are at war within yourself? You ever have someone look at you and say, hey, what's wrong with you? Nothing. Oh, well, what's the matter? Leave me alone. What's your problem? I ain't got a problem. And usually it's going on inside. It's what's happening inside. Well, I've got to land this plane because I already see what time it is. So let me finish it this way. Overcoming sin that produces loss and pain in your life is not as easy as falling off a log. I'd rather fall over a log. Get it over with. But it requires a deliberate development of my spiritual man that I strengthen and I practice spiritual exercises that keep me from stalling so that I can move from exploring to growing to Christ-centered and Christ-focused. See, your spirit then connects better with God when you deliberately say, Flesh, no. When you get up in the... I, I've learned. This is just what I've learned. This is just my theology. When I get up in the morning, I've decided and determined whom I'm serving that day. And it's a whole lot easier when I have to deal with the dross when it comes my way. Because in the morning, I said, as for me in my house, I'm serving the Lord. And I'm going to deliberately do whatever needs to be developed. I'm going to deliberately do what needs to be developed and practice the spiritual exercises that I need to practice in order that I don't stall, in order that I don't go back, in order that I become what God wants. See, your spirit then connects better with God. And as a result of that, you're able to overcome. Because now you have a Let me go back to my mom. I remember when my mom came home one day from her weight watching group. She was so excited. She lost X number of pounds. She had this smile on her face. She kind of had this step in her shoes. That she, you know, it was like, why? Because I could tell that she deliberately that week, deliberately did, so that when she stood on the scale... There was a transformation. And I'll never forget that. And what I do as a Christian, I know it's a great analogy, isn't it? What I do as a Christian, I deliberately do, I intentionally do, that when I'm put on the scale to be weighed, when I'm put in the battle to be fought, I stand there and I can go, yes, God did it because I can do all things through Christ who strengthened me. Why? Because I deliberately practiced what God called me to do and I deliberately did it and I saw a deliberate transformation. Father, today, I thank you and praise you that God, you don't want us to be fooled. You don't want us to settle for fool's gold. But you want us to be the gold refined in the fire. You want us to be the gold that is pure. You want us, oh God, to become what we can become. Yes, we can become what Jesus has called us to become. We can live godly lives. We can be all that Christ wants us to be. We can accomplish the will of God here and now. Whether we're exploring, whether we're growing, 
whether we're close to or whether we're Christ-centered, we, God, can achieve what you've called us to be. Now, I didn't get to it today. And I'll make more available next week. But I've given you a, a list of spiritual disciplines. Oh, this is not an exhausted list. These are just a few things that I've learned over the years that, that help me as a Christian. Things to exercise. I, I would encourage you this week to be pick out three or four of them. Don't pick out the whole list. It's like an elephant herd coming at you if you pick out the whole list. Remember, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time, right? Maybe two's too many. Pick one out and say, God, this week I'm going to practice this spiritual discipline. You know, you might be real good in fellowship. You might be real good in service. Well, I wouldn't put that one on my list. Maybe you're not so good in submission. Maybe you're, you're not real good at celebrating other wins with people. Maybe you're not real good at worshiping. Maybe you're not good at solit solitude. Oh, this week, God, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to practice a couple of these. Because, God, I want to find freedom in you. I want to find the presence of the Lord in my life. I want, I want to see that fresh wind. I want to see that new goal begin to come to the service. And I want to become, oh God, what you want me to be. We bow our head and close our eyes. Hallelujah. I believe, I'm sensing right now the Holy Spirit is speaking. I'm sensing right now the Spirit of God is, He's unpacking some things that maybe we've ignored and we've overlooked. Or maybe we realize we've been stalled and maybe we realize that we've been kept, we kept ourselves back from going to the next level. But you realize today, the Lord's in your corner. You're special to Him. You are special to Jesus. And He wants to take you to the next level. He wants to take you to the next phase of the journey. Could you take a moment and commit yourself to Him? Lord, here am I. I commit myself to the next level of the journey. Lord, I commit myself to, to do whatever I need to do. Maybe it's something that's not even on the list. That God, we need to see manifest in my life. Something, God, that just needs to be seen in my life. Maybe I'm Nic Nicodemus and I'm, I'm hung up on physical and I'm missing something spiritual. Reveal that to me, God. Reveal that to us. Let it happen this week. Let it be seen this week. I would challenge you today, if you're an explorer, like I gave on the handout, yes, you believe in God, but you're not certain about Jesus. Jesus, you can be certain about today before you leave this place. If you're viewing online, you can know beyond a shadow of a doubt that Jesus loves you. That He wants to forgive you of all of your sins. He wants to come into your heart. He wants to become your Savior. How do you do that? Maybe right here. Maybe out there. You say, Lord, I ask you in Jesus' name to come into my heart. Forgive me of my sins. Be my Savior. Jesus, will you help me grow? Jesus, will you help me mature? Link me to someone who's mature that they can speak into my life, that someone can help me become what Christ wants me to become. But Lord, right now I confess my sins before you. Forgive me of them and save me and cleanse me from all my unrighteousness. In His name I pray. Amen. Shall we stand? simply says Jesus reigns. He reigns in. This is the place where I want Him to reign. I'm not too concerned about this, but I am sure concerned about this. Oh God, can we sing it as we leave this place today?
God today. Oh, shower us, God, with your grace and mercy today, God. Let it fall on the soil of our heart today. Oh, let the freedom reign, that we won't stall out, that we won't get overwhelmed by the persecution, and we won't get overwhelmed by the distractions, and we won't get defeated, God, by the days of Lord that we are facing. But we'll know that God is with us, that God goes before us, that God, you're our source. You've not given up on us. You've not abandoned us, but you love us, and you care about us, and you long to see us as we long to be with you. Maybe you'd like to come and pray, spend some time with the Lord before we leave today. I encourage you to do so. But God, go with us. Be with us as we take the journey into the highways and the byways. Let us begin to share our faith and our hope and practice these disciplines that we become men and women that are godly and live lives that honor you. In Christ's name, bless your church. Keep them safe and healthy until we meet again in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you.